So this week we're covering chapter 12, Sociological Aspects of Young and Middle Adulthood. Learning objective one is to describe the following lifestyles and family forms that young adults may enter into, um, such as marriage, cohabitation, single life, parenthood, and the life of a childless couple. So most people make decisions during their young adult years about whether where they want to live as an adult. Decisions about lifestyles may include whether to marry or stay single, whether to have children, what kind of career to pursue, what area of the country they may want to live, and so on. When it comes to marriage, it is defined as a legally and socially sanctioned union between two people resulting in mutual obligations and rights. So about 92% of all adults in our society will get married. More than 90% of all married couples will have children. People marry for different reasons, including a desire for children, for economic security, social um, position, love, parents' wishes, escape, pregnancy, sexual attraction, common interests, and so on. Other reasons for marrying include societal expectations and the psychological need to feel wanted more than anyone else by someone and to be of value to another person. In our impersonal and materialistic society, marriage helps meet the needs to belong because it helps to provide emotional support and security, affection, love, and companionship. A number of studies have sought to identify factors associated with marital happiness and unhappiness. Um, some factors can help predict whether a future marriage will be happy or not. And other factors are related to whether an already existing marriage is happy or not. Marriages lead to the formation of a family, and family unit is recognized as the primary unit in which children are to be produced and raised. Marriage is also an arrangement to meet the emotional needs of partners such as affection, companionship, approval, encouragement, reinforcement, or accomplishment. Marriage also correlates with good health. Um, married people live longer, particularly men. Healthy people may be more interested in getting married, may be better marriage partners, or may attract mates more easily. Marriage also correlates with good health. Married people live longer, particularly men, but we cannot conclude that Marriage confers health. It's possible that healthy people may be more interested in getting married, um, may be better marriage partners, and may attract mates more easily. Or married people may lead safer, healthier lives than single people. Widowed and divorced men have shorter life expectancies than do single men. Perhaps widowed and divorced men have shorter life experiences because they feel that they have less to live for. The marriage relationship encourages personal growth. It provides a setting for the partners to share their innermost thoughts. Cohabitation is the open living together of an unmarried couple. So most couples live together for a relatively short time, less than two years, before they either marry or separate. For some, cohabitation serves as a trial marriage. For others, it offers a temporary or permanent alternative to marriage. And for many young people, it has become the modern equivalent of dating and going steady. People who cohabited before marriage do not have better marriages than those who did not. In fact, some research shows that couples who live together before getting married report lower quality marriages, a lower commitment to the institution of marriage, and a greater likelihood of divorce than do non-cohabiting couples. Cohabiting may also help some people clarify what they want in a mate in a marriage. Cohabiting also has its problems, some of which are similar to those encountered by newly weds, adjusting to an intimate relationship, working out a sexual relationship, over dependency on the partner, missing what one did when they lived alone, and seeing their friends less. So the original concept of common law marriage is a marriage that is considered valid by both partners, but has not been formally registered with a state or church registry. Common law marriages can be contracted in nine states in the U.S., um, including Colorado, Iowa, Kansas, Montana, New Hampshire, South Carolina, Texas, and Utah. Some people choose to remain single. They like being alone and prefer not being with others much of the time. 
Others end up being single because they do not find a partner they want to marry or because they are in the relationship with a partner who chooses not to marry. Single people have fewer emotional and financial obligations. They do not need to consider how those decisions and actions will affect a spouse or their children. They are freer to take economic, physical, and social risk. They can devote more time to pursuing um, individual interests. Studies reported that there are some advantages of being single, as some of the respondents indicated who were not married. Satisfaction of being self-sufficient, increased career opportunity, an exciting lifestyle, mobility, um, freedom to change, opportunities to have a variety of experiences, um, and those are some just some of the responses that people who are not married um, indicated were some of the benefits of being single. Some of the disadvantages reported included wondering how single people fit in the social world of mostly married people, lack of companionship, concern about how well friends and family accept unmarried adults, and concerns about how being single affects self-esteem. The birth of a baby is a major life event. Caring for a baby changes lifestyles of parents and also changes the marriage. For some, having a child who is totally dependent is a troublesome crisis. For others, caring for a baby is viewed as a fulfillment and an enhancement of life. The birth of a baby signals to parents that they are now adults and no longer children, and they now have responsibilities not only to themselves, but to someone who needs 24-hour care. Women generally assume the majority of both household and child care responsibilities. Research found that one third of mothers viewed mothering as both enjoyable and meaningful, and a third found it unpleasant and not meaningful, um, and another third reported mixed experiences. Fathers tend to treasure and to be emotionally committed to their children, but they generally reported less enjoyment in looking after them than mothers did. Having children is recognized legally and religiously as one of the central components of marriage. Our society still considers that something is wrong with a couple if they decide not to have children. So married couples may decide not to have children. Some may feel that they do not have what it takes to be good parents. Some have heavy commitments to their careers or to their hobbies and they do not want to take away from that to raise a family. Others may feel that having children would be an intrusion to their marital relationship. Um, some people may just want to travel and enjoy the, the spur of the moment trips or plans. Um, and a lot of people may not want to have their lifestyle changed. Learning objective two is to describe the major sociological theories about human behavior, um, including functionalism, conflict theory, and interactionism. People interact with various size systems within their social environment. These interactions have major impacts on human behavior. Um, we have established that culture, communities, institutions, and organizations are all examples of macro systems. Um, and to maximize their effectiveness, social workers must understand and assess the impacts of macro systems on their clients. Um, so this chapter will talk about three different theories addressing the macro social system. Um, the first one is the functionalist perspective. And in recent years, functionalism has been one of the most influential sociological theories. The theory views society as a well-organized system in which most members agree on common values and norms, institution, groups, and roles fit together in a unified whole. Members of society do what's necessary to maintain a stable society because they accept it as um, they accept its regulation and rule. Functionalism asserts that components of a society similar to the parts of the human body do not always work the way they are supposed to work. Things can get out of whack. When um, a component of a society interferes with efforts to carry out essential social tasks, this part is said to be dysfunctional. For example, Developing effective contraceptive and making them readily available is quite effective in preventing unwanted pregnancies. However, contraceptives may also be a factor leading to increased premarital and extramarital sexual relationships, which is also viewed as a problem by some groups. Because society is composed of interconnected parts, 
a change in one part of the system will lead to a change in other parts of the system. The introduction of automobiles in our society, for example, led to drastic changes. People being able to commute long distances, vacation travel to different parts of the country, the opening of many new businesses such as service stations, car dealerships. However, sharp increases in air pollution and traffic fatalities also increase. Um, some of the functions and dysfunctions of social systems are manifest that is obvious to everyone. So for example, a manifest function of police departments is to keep crimes low. Other functions and dysfunctions are latent, hidden, and unintended. Sociologists have discovered that when police departments label people, they arrest with such stigmatizing label as criminal, outlaw, and delinquent, a hidden consequence is that those who are labeled may also commit more crimes over the long run than when they than they would if they had never been arrested in the first place. Thus, in trying to curb crime, police departments may sometimes unintentionally contribute to an increase in crime. Social disorganization occurs when a large organization or an entire society is imperfectly organized to achieve its goal and maintain its stability. When disorganizing occurs, the organization loses control over its part. And the conflict theory views society as a struggle for power among various social groups. Conflict is thought to be inevit inevitable and in many cases actually beneficial to society. From the conflict perspective, social change mainly involves reordering the distribution of scarce goods among groups. Unlike functionalism, which views change as potentially destructive, the conflict approach views change as potentially, are potentially beneficial. Conflict can lead to improvements, advances, and reductions of discrimination against oppressed groups. Functionalist asserts that most people obey the law because they believe the law is fair and just. Conflict theorists assert that social order is maintained by authority backed by the use of force. They conclude that most people obey the law because they are afraid of being arrested in imprisoned, or even killed if they do not obey. Functionalists assert that most people in society share the same set of values and norms. In contrast, conflict theorists assert that modern societies are composed of many different groups with different values, attitudes, and norms, and therefore conflicts are bound to occur. The abortion issue illustrates such a value conflict. Um, for example, pro-life groups and traditional Roman Catholics believe that human fetuses at any stage after conception is a living human being and therefore aborting a pregnancy is murder. In contrast, pro-choice advocates assert an embryo for the first few months after conception is not yet a human being because it is unable to survive outside the womb. They also assert that if the state were to forbid a woman to obtain an abortion that the state would be violating her right to control her own life. So not all conflicts stem from disagreements over values. Some conflicts arise in part because people share the same values. In our society, for example, wealth and power are highly valued. The wealthy spend considerable effort and resources to maintain their position, whereas the poor, uh, the poor and oppressed advocate for equal rights and a more equitable distribution of income and wealth. Labor unions and owners in many businesses are in a continual battle over wages and fringe benefits. Republicans and Democrats continually struggle with one another in the hopes of gaining increased political power. The interactionist approach focuses on individuals in processes of everyday social interaction between them rather than on larger structures of society such as the educational system the economy, or religion. The interactionist theory asserts that human beings interpret or define each other's actions instead of merely reacting. The interactionist theory views human behavior as resulting from the interaction of a person's unique, distinguishing personality in the group he or she participates in. A direct offshoot of the interactionist perspective is the labeling theory. So this theory holds that the labels assigned to a person has a major impact on that person's life. Labels often become self-fulfilling prophecies. Um, so if a child is continually called stupid by his parents, that child is apt to develop a low self-concept, um, anticipate failure in many areas, put forth little effort in school and, comp and competitive interactions, 
with others and may end up failing. If a person is labeled an ex-con for spending time in prison, that person is likely to be viewed with suspicion, have trouble finding employment, and be stigmatized as dangerous and untrustworthy, even though the person may be conscientious and hardworking. Learning objective three is to understand three social problems that young and middle-aged adults may encounter, including poverty, empty shell marriages and divorce, one-parent families, blended families, and mothers working outside the home will also be discussed. Poverty and wealth are closely related. In most countries of the world, wealth is concentrated in a small percentage of the population. Abundance for a few is created by depriving others. There are two ways of measuring the extent of economic inequality. Income refers to the amount of money a person makes in a given period. Wealth is a person's total assets, um, including real estate holdings, cash, stocks, bonds, and so forth. The distribution of wealth and income is highly unequal in our society. Um, in the US, this is characterized by social stratification. That is, it has social classes with upper classes having far more greater access to pleasures that money can buy. Although this chapter focuses on poverty within the US, it's important to note that the growing gap between the rich and the poor is increasing throughout the world. These growing disparities between rich and poor throughout the world have a direct bearing on the situation of the poor in the US, um, as some areas where extremely poor people are willing to accept work at almost any wage. In the US, the wealthiest 1% of all households hold more than about one third of all personal wealth. The network refers to the value of all assets minus debt. Assets include savings and checking accounts, automobiles, real estate, stocks, and bonds. The wealthiest 20% of households in the US receive almost 50% of all income, whereas the poorest 20% receive less than 5% of all the income. About 50% of the population in the US is living below the poverty line. And the poverty line is the level of income that federal government considers sufficient to meet basic requirements of food, shelter, and clothing. In 2016, the poverty line for a family of four in the US was 24,300. One of the alarming elements about poverty is that many people do not fall under the government's poverty line and still have very limited incomes and living a standard that is similar to those living in the poverty line. Poverty does not simply mean that people in the US are living less well than people um, of average income. It means that eating diets largely of beans, macaroni and cheese, um, sometimes even dog or cat food. It may mean not having running water, living in substandard housing, being exposed to rats. Means, it may mean having insufficient heat in the winter and being able to, being unable to sleep because the walls are too thin. Um, it may mean that there is susceptibility to emotional disturbances, alcoholism, um, victimizations by criminals. It may mean that they're living in the slum, unstable marriages, little opportunity to enjoy finer things. Infant mortality rate among the poor is almost double rate than those who are not. Um, the poor are exposed to higher levels of air pollution, water pollution, any um, unsanitary conditions. They have higher rates of malnutrition and disease. Schools in poor areas have lower quality and fewer resources. Um, poverty also leads to despair, low self-esteem. The reality is the opposite of the dream. Research shows that children raised in poor families are themselves apt to live in poverty in their adult years. So uh, most people have the same social status as their parents did. Before the 20th century, a majority of the population in the US lived in poverty. Poverty is concentrated among certain population categories, including those who come from a one-parent family, children, older adults, large size families, people of color, and the homeless. Attainment of less than a ninth grade education is a good predictor of poverty. Um, completing a high school education, however, is not a guarantee that one will earn wages adequate to avoid poverty, as many of the poor have graduated from high school. A college degree is an excellent predictor of avoiding poverty, as only a small proportion of those with a college degree lives in poverty. Being unemployed is also related to poverty. Um, 
in rural, rural areas, there is high unemployment rates. Poverty is also extensive on Native American reservations and among seasonal migrant workers. There are a number of possible causes of poverty, including unemployment, poor physical health, emotional problems, drug addiction, low education level, racial and sexual discrimination, budgeting problems, mismanagement of resources, and mental problems. So the list can go on. However, it serves to show that poverty has many causes. Eliminating the causes for poverty could uh, require a wide range of social programs and poverty interacts with almost all other social problems, including emotional problems, alcoholism, unemployment, racial and sexual discrimination, medical problems, crime, gambling, and cognitive disabilities. Why is poverty passed on from one generation to others? Um, some authorities argue that explanation is due to culture of poverty. Lewis examined poor neighborhoods in various parts of the world and concluded that, poor are, that the poor are poor because they have a distinct culture or lifestyle. Blaming the poor for their circumstances is a convenient excuse, according to Ryan, for avoiding developing programs and policies thought necessary to end poverty. External reasons may include high rates of unemployment, racial discrimination, outsourcing jobs, lack of job training, sexual discrimination, shortage of programs to eradicate poverty and inflation. Poverty is functional. Sullivan, Sullivan and his colleagues listed 11 functions that the poor provide for the affluent. So they are available to do the unpleasant jobs that no one else wants to do. By their activities, they subsidize the more affluent. Jobs are established for those people, such as social workers who provide services to the poor. The poor purchase goods, such as those of poor quality that others would not um, sell. They serve as examples of deviants that are frowned on by the majority that thereby support dominant norms. They provide an opportunity for others to practice their Christian duty of helping the less fortunate. They make mobility more likely for others because they are removed from competition for good education and good jobs. They contribute to cultural activities by providing, for example, cheap labor, they serve as symbolic opponents for some political groups, and they often observe the cost of change. Functionalists view poverty as being due to dysfunctions in the economy. For example, people who lack job skills are forced into menial work at low wages. Then when automation comes, they are discharged without having work, money, or marketable skills. Some Products produced by industry also become outdated, such as steam engines, milk bottles, and horse-drawn carriages. Um, Functionalist also notes that the welfare system, which is intended to solve the problem of poverty, has a number of dysfunctions. Social welfare programs are sometimes established without sufficient funds to meet the needs of potential clients. Social welfare programs at times have signs of dysfunctions in meeting the needs of recipients. For example, in the past, mothers of young children in some states were eligible for public assistance only if the father was out of the home. Consequently, some unemployed men were forced to desert their families so that their children could be fed and sheltered. According to the functionalist, the best way to deal with poverty is to make adjustments to correct these dysfunctions. Conflict theorists assume that because there is such enormous Wealth in modern societies, no one in such societies should go without their essential needs being met. Um, they see poverty as arising because some group benefit from poverty of others. Um, from the conflict perspective, poverty becomes a social problem when some group feels that the existing distribution of resources is unjust and something should be done about it. Conflict theorists believe that Poverty can best be dealt with by the poor becoming politically aware and organizing to reduce inequality through government action. Interactionists emphasize the subjective nature of poverty. Poverty is viewed as being relative because it depends on what it is compared to. Interactionists view poverty as a matter of shared expectations. Um, interactionists emphasize that poverty is not just a matter of economic deprivation but it involves the person's self-concept. For example, 
A third generation welfare recipient is apt to view himself or herself much more negatively than a person working his or her way through college, even if both have the same income. So to resolve the poverty problem, interactionists urge that the stigma associated with poverty be eliminated. It is equally important to understand people's interactions with meso systems, small groups, including families. In empty shell marriages, the spouses feel no strong attachment to each other. Outside pressures are what's keeping the marriage together. Such outside pressures include business reasons, for example, an elective official wanting to convey a stable family image, investment reasons, for example, a, a husband and wife may have luxurious homes in other properties that they do not want to lose by parting, and outward appearances, so a couple living in a small community may remain together to avoid reaction of relatives and friends to a divorce. In addition, a couple may believe that ending the marriage would harm the children or may believe that getting a divorce would be morally wrong. Researchers identify three types of empty shell marriages. The vitalized relationship, husband and wife lack any real interest in each other. Um, boredom and apathy characterize this marriage and serious arguments are rare in this relationship. Conflict habituated relationships, the husband and wife frequently quarrel in private, they may also quarrel in public. Their relationship is characterized by considerable conflict, tension, and bitterness. In a passive, congenial relationship, the partners are not happy, but they are content with their lives and generally feel adequate. They may have some interests in common, but these interests are generally insignificant. This type of relationship um, generally has little conflict. Our society places a high value on romantic love than most other societies. Children in this country are socialized from early age to believe in the glories of romantic um, love. Magazines, television, programs, books portrays a happy ending romantic adventures, but the happily ever after rarely happens. About one or two marriages end up in divorce. Divorce usually leads to a number of difficulties for those involved. Um, those who are divorcing face emotional concerns, such as concerns that they have failed over whether they are able to give and receive love over the stigma attached to divorce, about the reactions of friends and family, and over whether they're doing the right thing by parting. Dividing up the personal property is another area that frequently leads to bitter differences of opinions. If there are children, there are concerns about how the divorce will affect them. Divorced people have a shorter life expectancy. Suicide rates are higher for divorced men. The reasons people decide the divorce may have nothing to do with specific bad qualities of the marriage partners. Rather, a major reason people divorce is disappointment with each other. In, in other words, partners simply do not measure up to their spouse's expectations. There are also many sources of marital breakdowns, including alcoholism, economic strife caused by unemployment, or any other financial problems. Another factor that is contributing to an increasing divorce rate is unwillingness of some men to accept the changing status of women. Many men still prefer a traditional marriage in which the husband is dominant and the wife plays a supportive, subordinate role as a child rearer, housekeeper, and emotional supporter for her husband. Many women no longer accept such a status and demand equal um, decision-making when it comes to major decisions, doing domestic tasks, um, raising the children, and bringing home paychecks are also shared responsibilities. Another factor contributing to the increasing rates of divorce has to do with the growth of individualism. Um, individualism involves the belief that people should seek to develop their interests and capacities to their fullest to fulfill their own needs and desires. Another reason for the rising divorce rates is the growing acceptance of divorce in our society. With less stigma attached to divorce, more people who are unhappily married are not ending their marriage. About one child in four in the U.S. lives in a home with only one parent, and there may be several reasons for that. It could be divorce, death of a spouse, births outside of marriage. About 90% of these families are headed by women. The rate of female-headed homes in African-American families is nearly three times that in white families, which is more than 60%. Um, a single parent wrestles with responsibilities and tasks equal to two full-time jobs in traditional two-parent families. Female-headed one-parent families are much more common today. Poverty affects one 
parent families significantly more than it does two parent families. Differences in the average income levels of one parent female headed families and two parent families are striking. 29% of female headed families are living in poverty compared to 7% of two parent families. White mothers who live in poverty most likely have been married. Um, their current single status results from divorce, separation, or death of a spouse. African American mothers in poverty, however, are more likely to have born their children without having been married. So as mentioned before, one in two marriages in the U.S. ends up in divorce. Many people who divorce have children. Most people who divorce remarry within a few years. Some people who are marrying for the first time have parented a child while single. Some people cohabitate and one or two parents may have children from a prior relationship. Thus, a variety of blended families um, are being formed in our society. A blended family is basically any non-traditional configuration of people who live together, are committed to each other, and perform functions traditionally assumed by families. Um, such relationships may not involve biological or legal linkages. And some of the terms used to describe these families could be step family, blended family, or non-traditional families. One or both partners have to adjust to raising children in, that are not biologically parented by someone else. Um, the children in blended families have to form relationship with step-siblings. The children in such families also have to adjust to prior divorce. Many children in blended families have to form new relationships with biological parents who is absent from the home and with a step-parent. There are also some other issues that may arise um, jealousies may arise between new siblings. These jealousies may focus on sharing of um, parental attention with the new partner and the new siblings. Another issue for children is adjusting to a new parent who may have different ideas, values, rules, and expectations. Um, yet another adjustment involves sharing space and property when children aren't used to sharing with these new people or sharing at all. And finally, if one member of the couple comes into the relationship with no child rearing experiences, an adjustment is going to be necessary for all family members um, to allow time for the new parent to learn and adapt. So there are three myths about blended families. There is the myth of wicked stepmother. I'm sure you have all heard this. Um, this involves the idea that the stepmother is not really concerned about what is best for the children, but is more concerned about her own well-being. In reality, stepmothers have been found to establish very positive and caring relationships with stepchildren, um, provided that the stepmother has a strong self-concept and support of her husband. Um, a second myth is step is less. So in other words, this myth asserts that stepchildren will never hold the same place in the hearts of parents that biological children do. This myth does not take into account the fact that people can learn to love each other and are motivated to bind members of the new family together. The third myth about blended family is that the moment they become joined as one family, they will have instant love for each other. Relationships take time to develop and grow. Step families need to pursue at least four tasks in order to achieve integration. The first task involves acknowledging that losses from all relationships do exist. The second task is for step families in the creation of new customs and traditions. So new ways of doing things need to be established. Um, the third task for blended families involve establishing new alliances with family. Um, alliances may involve not only the new couple's relationship with each other, but also relationships among siblings and between parents and children. The fourth task for blended families is integration. Parents have the responsibility of providing organization for the family. Children need to have their limits defined and consistently upheld. Researchers have suggestions to help parents and blended families to increase the chances of positive relationship. Um, one is to understand the emotions of their children, allowing time for loving relationships to develop between step parents and step children, new rituals, traditions, and ways of doing things that seem right and enjoyable for all members of the blended family need to be developed and they need to seek social support. So a major break with tradition has occurred with the surge of married women entering the workforce over the past several decades. So employment of married women with children under 18 has risen from 24% back in 1950 to 40% in 1970 to 70% in 2013. Among female-headed one-parent families, 71% of mothers were employed. 
and most working moms um, are working full time. So there has been some concerns about the effects of working mothers um, on the social and emotional development of children. However, research indicates that women do not have to remain home in order to maintain well-adjusted families. Um, review of research on working mothers and their children conclude that if the mother is satisfied with her job and provision for childcare is reasonably good and suitable, there is no adverse effect on the child's development. Some questions have been raised concerning the effects on children under age three when mothers work outside the home. These questions tend to revolve around the issue of maternal deprivation. Um, concerns were initially raised after some early research indicated that institutionalized infants suffered negative effects. This research related these um, negative effects to the fact that mothers were absent. However, could these effects have been due to the fact that the infants received inadequate care and very little attention from anyone? So many middle-aged adults are sandwiched between two generations, their parents and their children. This puts great demands and pressures on them um, because older adults are the fastest growing age group in terms of numbers in our society. An increasing proportion of middle-aged adults will find themselves providing care for their parents as well as their children. So middle-aged adults have their children and a parent or two living with them and people find it difficult to find time and resources to respond to the needs and demands of their work their children and their parents. Learning objective four is to understand material on assessing and intervening in family systems. Communication involves transmitting information from one person to another using a common system of symbols, signs, or behaviors. Verbal communication involves the use of words and will be addressed first. Um, the first phase of verbal communication involves the translation of thoughts into words. The information sender must know the correct words and how to put them together. The information receiver then must be receptive to the information. That is, he or she must pay attention to both the sender and the sender's words. The sender also transmits nonverbal messages along with the verbal ones. These include facial expressions, body post posture, emotions displayed, and many other sub subtle aspects of communications. All of this gives the receiver additional information about the intent and specific meaning of the messages that are being sent. Sometimes the receiver will attribute more value to the nonverbal aspects of the messages than to the verbal ones. Nonverbal messages can sometimes contradict message, verbal messages. For example, a recently widowed woman says, I'm sorry, Frank passed away with a big grin on her face. The information expressed by the words indicate that she's sad. However, her accompanying facial expression shows that she is happy. Her words are considered socially appropriate for the situation. However, in this particular case, she seems relieved to get rid of the old buzzard and happy to be beneficiary of a large insurance policy. So the double message reflected by the widow's verbal and nonverbal behavior provides a relatively simple, clear-cut illustration of potential problem communications within families. So your verbal message could be saying one thing, but your nonverbal message could be saying something completely different. Family norms are the rules that specify what is considered proper behavior within the family group. Often the most powerful rules are those that are not clearly and verbally stated. Rather, these are implicit rules or repeated family transactions that all family members understand but never discuss. The ECOMAP is a paper and pencil assessment tool that practitioners use to assess specific troubles um, and plan intervention for clients. The ECOMAP is a drawing of the client family in the social environment. Um, an ECOMAP is usually drawn jointly by the social worker and the client. It helps both the worker and the client achieve holistic or ecological view of the client's family life and the nature of the family's relationship with groups, associations, organizations, or other families and individuals. The genogram is a graphic way of investigating the origin of a client's problem by diagramming the family over at least three generations. The client and the worker usually construct the family genogram jointly. Um, the genogram is essentially a family tree. The genogram is a useful tool for the worker and family members to examine problematic emotions and behavioral patterns in an intergenerational context. So emotional and behavioral patterns in families tend to repeat themselves. What happens in one generation will often occur in the next. Genograms help family members to identify and understand family relationship patterns. 
Researchers point out that although each family is unique, conflicts and problems within families tend to cluster in four major categories. Marital problems between husband and wife, difficulties between parents and children, personal problems of individual family members, and stresses imposed on family by the external um, environment. Learning objective five um, is to summarize material on social work with organizations, including several theories of organizational behavior. So organizations are social entities um, and their goal directed. They are designed as deliberate, deliberately structured and coordinated activity systems. Um, they are linked to the external environment. So social entities involve groups of people all having their own strengths, needs, ideas, and perks. Organizations are goal-directed in that they exist to um, accomplish some purpose or meet some need. As an activity system, an organization is made up of a coordinated series of units accomplishing different tasks, yet working together to achieve some common end. Finally, organizations are in constant interaction with other people, decision makers, agencies, neighborhoods, and communities in external social environments as they strive for um, achieving certain goals. It is imperative that social workers have an extensive knowledge of organizations. The autocratic model had, has been in existence for thousands of years. So when it comes to the autocratic model, it uses one-way communication from the top to the workers. Management believes that it knows what's best. The employee's obligation is to follow orders. Um, employees have to be persuaded, directed, and pushed into performance. And this is, this is the management's task. Management does the thinking and the workers obey the directives. Under autocratic conditions, the worker's role is obedience to management. So many decades ago, when the autocratic model was the predominant model of organizational behavior, some progressive managers began to study their employees. They found that the autocratic model often resulted in employees feeling insecure um, about their continued employment Employees also had feelings of aggression towards, ma towards management um, because the employees could not express their discontent directly, they expressed it indirectly. Some vented their anger on their families and neighbors and the entire community suffered. Um, and this sometimes sabotaged production. So to satisfy the employees' security needs, a number of companies began to provide welfare programs such as pension programs, childcare centers, health insurance, and life insurance. Um, the custodial approach leads to employee dependence on the organization. Um, so according to Davis and Newstrom, if employees have 10 years of seniority under the union contract and a good pension program, they cannot afford to quit even if the grass looks greener somewhere else. So employees working under a custodial model tend to focus on their economic rewards and benefits and they're happier and more content than under the autocratic model. But they do not have a high commitment to helping their organizations accomplish its goals. Um, they tend to give passive cooperation to their employer. So when it comes to the human relations model, um, it came about when managers designed to discover ways to increase workers' satisfaction and worker productivity. The workers were not unionized and management sought to find ways to increase productivity. If job satisfaction could be increased, employees would work more efficiently and productivity would then increase. The company tested the effects on productivity of a number of factors, including rest breaks, better lighting, changes in the number of work hours, changes in the wages paid, improved food uh, facilities, and so on. The results were surprising. So productivity increased as expected when improved working conditions, but it also increased when working conditions worsened. Um, the investigators discovered that participation in these experiments were extremely attractive to workers who felt that they were selected by management for their individual abilities. Um, as a result, they worked harder even when working conditions became less favorable. Um, in addition, the workers' morale and general attitude towards work improved because they felt that they were receiving special attention. Um, participating in the study enabled them to work in smaller groups and they become involved in making decisions. Working in smaller groups allowed them to develop a stronger sense of solidarity with their fellow workers. Being involved in decision making decreased their feelings of meaningless, 
meaninglessness and powerlessness about their work. So this is where the Hawthorne, eff the Hawthorne effect came in. Uh, in essence, when people know that they are participants in a study, this awareness may lead them to behave differently than substantially influencing the results. So if participants know that they're being watched, they know that they're being observed, they're going to display different behaviors than if they weren't being watched. One criticism of the human relations model is that it tends to manipulate, um, dehumanize, oppress, and exploit workers. The model leads to conclusion that management can increase productivity by helping workers become content rather than increasing economic rewards for higher productivity. The human relations model allows for concentrated power and decision making at the top. It is not intended to empower employees in decision making process or to assist them in acquiring genuine participation in running an organization. Another criticism of the human relations approach is that a happy workforce is not necessarily a productive workforce because the norms for worker production may be set well below what the workers are capable of doing. So QRX and Y. QRX managers view employees as being incapable of much growth. Employees are perceived as having an inherent dislike for work and attempting to evade work whenever possible. Therefore, X-type managers believe that they must control, direct, force, or threaten their employees to make them work. Employees are also viewed as having relatively little ambition, wishing to avoid responsibilities, and preferring to be directed. Um, Fury X managers therefore spell out job responsibilities carefully. They set work goals without employee input, use external rewards such as money to push employees to work, and punish those who deviate from established rules. Because Tory X managers reduce responsibilities to the level at which few mistakes can be made, work usually becomes so structured that it is monotonous and distasteful. These Tory X assumptions, of course, are inconsistent with what behavioral scientists um, asserts are effective principles for directing, influencing, and motivating people. In contrast, Tory Y managers view employees as wanting to grow and develop by exerting physical and mental effort to accomplish work objectives um, to which they're committed. These managers believe that promise of internal rewards such as self-respect and personal improvement are stronger motivations than external rewards such as money and punishment. They also believe that under the proper conditions, employees will not only accept responsibility but seek it. Most employees are assumed to have considerable uh, creativity, um, imagination for problem solving. Therefore, they are given considerable responsibility to test the limits of those capacities. Um, mistakes and errors are viewed as necessary phases of the learning process and work is structured so that employees have a sense of accomplishment and growth. Employees who work for Y-type managers are generally more creative and productive. Um, they experience greater work satisfaction and are more highly motivated than employees who work for the X-type manager. The collegial model emphasizes the team concept. Employees work together closely and feel a commitment to achieving common purpose. Some organizations such as university departments, research labs, and most human services organizations have a goal of creating a collegial atmosphere to facilitate achieving their purpose. So the basic philosophy of Fury Z is that involved and committed workers are the key to increase productivity. Ideas and suggestions about how to improve the organizations are routinely solicited and implemented where feasible. One strategy for accomplishing this is the quality circle, where employees and management routinely meet to brainstorm about ways to improve productivity and quality. When it comes to management by objectives, Management theorists propose a strategy for making organizational goals and objectives the central construct around which organizational life um, is designed to function. So the strategy is first to identify the organizational objective or goals, and then to adopt the organizational task resources um, to meet those objectives. This management by objectives approach is designed to focus the organizational effort on meeting those objectives. Um, success is determined then by the degree to which stated objectives are reached. This approach can be applied to the organization as a whole, as well as to internal divisions or departments. 
When the management by objective approach is applied to internal divisions, the objective set for each division should be consistent with and supportive of the overall organizational objectives. In many areas, including human services, the management by objective approach can be also be applied to cases serviced by each employee. Um, goals are set with each client tasked to meet these goals are then determined um, and deadlines are set to for completion of these tasks. One major advantage of the management by objective approach for an organization or its divisions is that it produces clear statements um, about the objectives and the tasks that are expected to be accomplished in specified time periods. The management by objective approach is also useful to because it provides a guide for allocating resources and a focus for monitoring and evaluating organizational efforts. Um, an additional benefit of, the, of this approach is that it creates diversity in the workplace. Prior to this approach, those responsible for hiring failed to employ women and people of color in significant numbers. So the total quality management is based on a number of ideas. It means that thinking about quality in terms of all functions of the enterprise and a start to finish process that integrates inter interrelational functions at all levels. It is a system approach that considers every interaction between various elements of an organization. So with the total quality management approach, it maintains that a customer satisfaction is the main purpose of the organization. Therefore, quality includes continuously improving all the organizational processes um, and lead to customer satisfaction. The customer is seen as the part of the design and production process as the customer needs must be continually monitored. In regards to human service agencies, here are some principles or some guiding principles of the total quality management. The first and major principle is to satisfy customer. The customer is the one paying for the service. Human service agencies should instill pride into every employee. Complaints from customers or from employees should be viewed as opportunities for improvement. Supervisors should seek to keep their supervisees happy and productive by providing good task suggestions, the tools they need to do their jobs and good working conditions. And employees are an excellent source of ideas for improvements. Two of the most common organizational theories for social workers are theory X and theory Y. These theories were described earlier. Um, theory X supervisors rely heavily on threat of punishment to gain employee compliance. Um, this managerial style is more effective when used, to when used to motivate workforce that is not inherently motivated to perform. Theory Y, in contrast, is characterized by viewing the worker as being the most important asset of the organization. Theory Y supervisors assume that worker not only like their careers, but also are willing to take on some amount of professional responsibility. Theory Y supervisors seek input from workers on how organization can make changes in order to better serve customer or clients. If a worker has Theory X supervisors, then that worker can best survive by doing what the supervisor tells him or her to do. That worker should make few suggestions for changes in the organization because suggesting for changes will irritate the supervisors. To feel fulfilled or gratified as a person, a worker in this situation should, should seek recognition from outside sources such as their church or other places of worship, athletic team, friends or family members. If a worker has theory Y supervisors, then that worker can best survive or thrive by making suggestions for changes as these are expected and appreciated. Also workers can expect to be praised and promoted by and promoted for work that is well done. When working for theory Y supervisors, a worker is more apt to find recognition and become more ego invested with that organization. A servant leader is someone who look to both the needs of the organization and the needs of the employees. The servant leader, administrator, supervisor asks herself how she can help the people she's supervising to solve problems and how she can best promote their personal development. A theory why supervisor has the same orientation. A bureaucracy can be defined as a form of social organization whose distinctive characteristic includes a vertical hierarchy with power centered at the top, a task specific division of labor, clearly defined rules, formalized channels of communication and selection, compensation, promotion, and retention based on 
technical competence. Um, helping professions places a high value in creativity and changing the system to serve clients. Bureaucracies resist change and are most efficient when no one is rocking the boat. Helpful professionals seek to personalize services by conveying to each client and you count as a person. Bureaucracies are highly depersonalized, emotionally detached system that view every employee and every client as a tiny component of a larger system. In theory, the task of making decisions about an organization's objectives and goals would follow a rational process. This process would include identifying the problems, specifying resource limitations, weighing the advantage and disadvantage of a proposed solution, and seeing the resolution of strategy with the fewest risk and greatest chances of success. In practice, however, subjective influence um, can impede the rational process. Value orientation means an individual's own ideas about what is desirable and worthwhile. Most values are acquired through prior learning experiences, interactions with families, friends, educators, organizations, such as your church or anyone else. Researchers suggest six value orientations as follows. Theoretical, so a person with a theoretical orientation strives towards a rational systematic ordering of knowledge. Economic, so an economic orientation places primary value on utility of things and practical uses of knowledge are given foremost attention. Uh, aesthetic, an aesthetic orientation is grounded in appreciation of artistic values and personal preferences for form, harmony, and beauty in influential in making decisions. Social orientation is an empathetic one that values other people as ends in themselves. Political orientation involves concern for identifying where power lies. And religious orientation, um, a person with religious orientation is directed by a desire to relate to the universe in some meaningful way. Learning objective six is to describe liberal, conservative, and developmental perspectives on human service organizations. Politicians and decision makers often make their decision on human service issues in terms of whether they adhere to a liberal or a conservative philosophy. Republican Party is considered to be relatively conservative and Democratic Party is considered to be relatively liberal. Conservatives tend to resist change. They emphasize tradition and believe um, rapid change usually results in more negative than positive consequences. In economic matters, conservatives feel that the government should not interfere with the workings of marketplace. Conservatives generally view individuals as being autonomous, um, that is being self-governing regardless of what a person's situation is or what a problem or what problem he or she has. Each person is thought to be responsible for his own behavior. Conservatives view people as having free will and thus is able to choose to engage in behaviors such as hard work that help them get ahead. Poverty and other problems are seen as being the result of laziness, irresponsibility, or lack of self-control. Conservatives believe that social welfare programs force hardworking, productive citizens to pay for consequences of irresponsible behavior of re recipients of welfare services. Um, conservatives also believe that dependency is a result of personal failure and also believe it is natural for inequality, inequality to exist among humans. Um, conservatives also believe that charity is a moral virtue and that fortunate are obligated to help the less fortunate become productive contributing citizens. In contrast, liberals believe that change is generally good as it brings progress. Moderate change is best. They view society as needing regulation to ensure fair competition um, between various interests. In particular, the market economy is viewed as needing regulation to ensure fairness. Government programs, including social welfare programs, are viewed as necessary to help meet basic human needs. Liberals advocate government action to remedy social deficiencies and improve human welfare. Developmental view offers an alternative approach that appears to appeal to liberals, conservatives, and to the general public. Um, this perspective has appealed to liberals because it supports the because it supports the development and expansion of needed social welfare programs. Um, it also appeals to conservatives because it asserts the it asserts that the development of certain social welfare programs will have a positive impact on the economy. And this concludes chapter 12. Next week, we'll move on to chapter 13.